my, I think, fourth year with uh, the Digital Learning Lab. Popcorn it to Madeline. Hi, my name is Madeline Jordan, but I go by Maddie. So I'm Maddie. Um, I am a ESL and citizenship instructor at Erie Neighborhood House. So, and this is my first time attending um, this seminar. So um, I will toss it over to Jennifer. Hi, Maddie, nice to meet you. Um, my name is Jennifer Magill. Um, this is my fourth year as a subject matter expert with, um, as Michael said, formerly IDLL. It's going to take me a while just to call it DLL. Um, I am an instructional design consultant, um, and I'm also an instructor at the University of Virginia. And I will go ahead and popcorn it over to Ann Darton. Darton, she's our guest speaker later. Thanks, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. I'm Ann Darnton. I see some people here I know really well and some new people I'm just meeting today. I, I am a consultant for women employed and uh, look forward to speaking with you a bit later. Oh, I have to popcorn it. Uh, how about Jamil? Hello, everyone. I'm Jamil Steele. I am the director of adult education and literacy here at Lincoln Land Community College. I am a four-timer DLL, and, and this is the second time I'm doing it in this capacity. I'm excited to be on board with everyone. And like uh, Jennifer said, I'm gonna have a problem trying to just go from DLL, I guess now it's DL, right? <laughs> but I will be able to scale it. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who do you want to toss it to? I'm yeah. going to toss it to Antonio or Anton. Antoine. It's Antoine. I'm sorry. It's French, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, my name is Antoine Lona. I'm the director of adult education at Centro Romero and uh, first time digital lab. Uh, I forgot the name already. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry about that. Uh, don't worry about the name. I'm just glad you're all here <laughs> and participating. <laughs> and it's look great to see all of you. Once again, Antoine, you want to toss it to someone? Uh, I'll toss it to David Rosen. Hi, thank, thanks, Antoine. Nice to meet you all, those who I uh, don't already know. Uh, I've been with the Digital Learning Lab right from the beginning uh, as a sub subject matter expert and team leader, and I'm glad to be back this year. I uh, am an out-of-stater. I live in Massachusetts, in fact, in the city of Boston where I am right now. And uh, my uh, interests are wide ranging, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, technology and integrating technology, which is a long uh, interest of mine, uh, I'm particularly interested right now in something called high flex models of learning. It's uh, something that actually a good number of programs in Illinois are using. And so if you're in my team, you're gonna hear about it. And if you're not in my team and you'd like to talk about it, I'd love to talk with you. Oh, uh, and let's see, how about Sue Jones? All right, and I've been taking notes in the chat because I can never remember who's gone and who hasn't yet. So uh, I'm Sue Jones, I am in, also in Champaign, Illinois, but I'm up at Parkland College at the Community College. And my most, what I do mostly do is support students who are taking adult ed or remedial level math and reading classes, but I keep working on stuff to make it better and helping our adult ed folks figure stuff out with technology. And I'm going to uh, toss it to Monique. Did I say your name right? Yes, you did. Um, my name is Monique. I'm with Touch Gift Foundations. I am the office coordinator, and this is only my first week. <laughs> um, just got 
down from doing that, but I've been in education for over 20 years. Um, what I'll be doing in this office is coordinating pretty much everything that goes in and out of the office, but I will also be tutoring um, for math as well as um, GED courses. And so I am going to talk over to um, August, Augustine. Thank you, Monique. How are you? I'm well. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Agustin Jaramillo. Um, fourth year here. Uh, everyone kind of knows me as AJ, though. So AJ works. Um, I work at Greater West Town Training Partnership, uh, workforce development, and I teach digital literacy along with some other career uh, focused courses. So hello, everybody. Um, and um, yeah, let's let's start learning. Uh, I'm going to toss it to a cohort compatriot from I don't even remember last year the first year the year before that Joanne how are you Joanne you're muted I just realized I was muted because I was moving papers around uh, hi AJ thank you uh, it's nice to see some of the people that I met in the last two years this is my third year in the cohort and I'm excited to be here I'm the director of digital literacy at um, no, I'm the director, well, of program development. Sorry, I've got digital literacy in my head now. I'm the director of program development at Literacy Chicago. And um, Antoine, there's nothing wrong with French. That's my other nationality. <laughs> I will popcorn over to... Um, and, and Joanne, how can we get everyone in the country just to... Just think digital literacy and nothing else. <laughs> like, I, I developed the first digital literacy program about five years ago for Literacy Chicago. So it's been uh, as part of the N10 cohort. That was my project. So it's been something I've been involved in and working on. Um, yeah. It's in the forefront right now. <laughs> and, yes. So I'll pop over to Lori. Who, oh, she was here. Did she disappear just now? She's, she's uh, double duty. She's driving. And oh, how did you know that? <laughs> oh, there she is. Hi, Laurie. I, I just pulled over <laughs> for everybody concerned. Yes, how are you? It's very nice to see a lot of familiar faces. Yes, I just pulled over and I'm going to be going inside to a secure location. Um, I'm Laurie Hoffman. <laughs> I'm the program manager with Literacy DuPage, which is in Eaton, uh, Wheaton, Illinois. I was with another program when I was uh, participating with Digital uh, IDLL. I've been in projects with David Rosen, uh, Jennifer Madrell with World Education. So I'm looking forward to another year of participation with this project. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to turn off I'm going to exit the meeting and join for my safe. You want location. me to toss it over to someone yes, for you? Please, you I might can't not be able to hear. Thank yeah. you, Laurie. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carol, you ready? Yes. How are you? Hi, I'm Carol Walls. I'm with the Learning City of Chicago. And I teach, I'm an instructor there, ABE and adult education as well. This is I've been with this organization since the beginning. And it's nice to see so many familiar faces. And I'll pop point it over to Sybil. Hi, Carol. How are uh, you? All right. Hi, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm Sybil Morrison. I am with the Literacy Leaders of Minnesota slash Scale Lit as a digital navigator. Only been with them for about two months now, but very excited because I'm learning a lot of things. Oh, let me see, who can I? Want to toss it over to someone too? Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Um, Kay. Toss it to you, Kay. <laughs> Great, thanks, Sybil. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kay Crandall, and I am also on the Scale It team. 
uh, working as a digital literacy navigator, supporting Michael and um, getting this year of the project started. And um, we're really happy to have you all here today. Um, I am going to pass it on to Laura. Hi, my name is Laura Carr. I'm with the United for a Better Live in Chicago. I'm the adult literacy coordinator and I love what I do. Um, I have to get used to the DLL. I'm used to the IDLL, <laughs> but um, I'm thankful for being here. And, uh, and I will talk this over now to Daniela. Did I say that right? It's Danielle. Um, I am brand new. Um, I am with IECC down in Southern Illinois. Um, we have four colleges. I am the adult education instructor at LTC, Lincoln Trail College. Um, typically, you guys have been in contact with Angel McGuire, but she's passing the torch a little bit and had, couldn't be here today. So um, I am brand new and just taking all the notes. I will pass it to, let me see. Um, has Abel done it? No. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Abel. Uh, we're in the office, so you'll see me with a mask. Um, this is my first time uh, here. Uh, I'm the resource room uh, facilitator at CERCO with the Workforce uh, Investment Act, YOA. And we try to help our participants, you know, uh, simplify technology to the lowest common denominator. Basically, that's what we do here. So I'm excited to learn from everyone. Everyone has been here for quite some time. So I'm excited to be here. I'll toss it to um, who hasn't gone. Ginger, maybe? I'm not sure. Hi, I'm Ginger Horner from Shawnee Community College. I'm the Director of Adult Ed and Alternative Instruction. This is my, I think it's my third year with DLO. Um, I'm a huge fan. And so all of you folks who are here for the first time, um, you're in for such a great experience. So I'm really excited for a new year and to see what great things we share with one another this year. Um, and I'm going to pass it to, um, let's see, I've lost track of who, Laura? No. I, I can help a little bit here. Um, let, Thank you. Let's toss it over to Jose. Thank you, Ginger. Hey, everyone. Um, I am very excited to be here. My name is Jose Luis Mosqueda, and I work for Erie House based in Chicago. I see uh, some of my colleagues and co-workers here, here, friends. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. And I'll pass it to uh, Katrina. Katrina is one of our instructors here in your house. Hi, uh, my name is Katrina Cunningham and I'm an instructor with ESL ABE. Um, with Erie House, and this is my first time here in this platform, and so I'm looking forward to learning something new, and um, thank you. Thank you, and uh, I'll, I can help, but we're down to the last few here. Uh, um, Joy, did you go yet? Not yet. Um, I'm Joy Pack. Um, I I'm at Harper College Data and Reporting, and previously I was an ESL instructor and coordinator before that. And I've been at the very beginning with DLL. I know I have to hesitate when I say that because I have to think about it, but I'm very happy. I'm one of the subject matter experts and um, I'm looking forward to a really good um, cohort year. Um, I'm gonna popcorn it over to William. Have you gone yet? I haven't. Well, hello, friends. I'm William. I teach GED classes at Lewis and Clark Community College. It's down in Southern Illinois. And you'll have to excuse me, I've lost my voice. So if I sound like Darth Vader, I'm sorry. And uh, I'm, I'm camping here in Southern Illinois with my kids. So 
pardon me if uh, if you hear screaming and laughter in the background, but I'm super thankful to be here, guys. And I might need Michael. I might need your help uh, in in selecting somebody because I'm not sure who's went yet. Thank you all. Um, let's see. Did we miss anyone? Um, I can go next. <laughs> uh, my name is Abigail Milian. I am a program manager for Workforce at Erie House. Uh, this is my first time uh, here with Scalet, uh, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Did I miss anyone? Did we, Madeline, did you go? I think you did, right? Hi, sorry. Yes, I did. Okay, thank you so much. So, hey, let me uh, take a, a quick screenshot. If, if, if you can, and you can turn on your cameras for just a uh, um, couple of seconds, really. Uh, I'm going to um, take a screenshot with everybody on, hopefully. Thank you so much. Um, well, let, let's get started. Let's get started with our day here. Um, and um, if if you um, want to turn off your cameras, you can. If you want to turn whenever you want to turn them on, uh, there'll there'll be opportunities for us to also uh, unmute yourselves and and um, and be able to to ask questions that way too. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen here. Um, and. All right, so um, basically our, our agenda uh, today is uh, for me just to um, just give you a little bit of background on the on the digital learning lab and um, our 2022 launch, um, as well as um, connecting everything else we're going to do with with uh, this little bit of, of background here. Um, so um, this project, the digital learning lab, is uh, a project of Scale It. And that's the organization that I work for, as you can see there. Um, that's my title, Education Technology Director, and my email. So feel free to reach out uh, with any questions uh, that you might have as, um, as we continue this project throughout the year. Um, I'd also like to introduce our, our four subject matter experts, um, which um, just to mention that they're um, as we continue to plan here and, and bring in uh, just a few more members, so we currently have about 21. Um, our goal is 25 um, in the process of the paperwork back and forth and the contracts and all of that and finding the, the, the commitment within uh, separate organizations. Um, we will we'll probably bring in another um, subject matter expert as well. And of course, those introductions will go out. Um, so we have Jennifer Madrell, Joy Pack, David Rosen, and Michelle Shelmo, um, and uh, these, these uh, subject matter experts are experts, um, and they are just great at what they do, and um, the, the support you get from them is just amazing, and you will all see that as we go on through the year. Thank you for being here. Um, so here's our agenda for today. Um, and I'm not going to drill into this too much, but you have you can see that there. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, my my goal is to um, try to close this out around three o'clock and not go all the way three thirty, and hopefully give you guys uh, back a, a few more uh, minutes to start your uh, weekend. Um, a little bit about Scale It. Uh, we were formerly called the Chicago Citywide Literacy Coalition, and uh, we announced our name change at our annual fundraiser and uh, Beyond Books, uh, which I'm, uh, a few of you have attended in the past. Um, Scale It reflects the, the organization's vision to expand services to help organizations use uh, adult literacy be uh, best practices to more effectively serve the community. So under the new name, Scale It continues to assist its members in advancing work uh, in its core program areas of career found, uh, career uh, pathways, digital literacy, and health literacy. Um, I'm not gonna go over all of this, but you can see the little 
history line here, the timeline uh, of Scalit, um, starting back from uh, 2003 when uh, uh, Scalit, um, then called Chicago Citywide Literacy Coalition, uh, was founded by a, a group of adult literacy providers in, in 2003 uh, to improve the quality of adult education programs in the city of Chicago. Um, to now, where we're expanding our one-stop operator, career pathways navigator, our digital equity and inclusion departments, and introducing North Star Digital Literacy into American Job Centers and, and, and across Cook County. So that's some of the things that we're involved with now. Um, and then also just a little bit of a timeline of, of digital literacy. As you can see here, back in 2016, uh, we had a project called the Adult Literacy uh, and Technology Integration Project, or ALTIP, um, which really looked at best practices, uh, technology integration to uh, increase service capacity and, and participant outcomes. And I was actually in, involved in that project as, as a consultant at the time. Um, and then, uh, as you can see now that, um, um, scale it is part of the Chicago uh, um, Mayor's Digital Equity Council, um, and that hopefully shows our little timeline uh, towards where we're at now, building the digital equity and, and inclusion, um, digital literacy. Um, so connect with Scale It. Once again, my email, there's our, uh, our address and our uh, website as well. And I will be sharing these slides with everyone later. Um, I also want to share our, um, our website, which I will come back to this a little bit later and go through the website a little, a little bit. Um, this is a website that was put together for the Digital Learning Lab. Um, it's got a number of resources and hopefully we'll continue to populate it even more as the year goes on. Um, and that is the QR code and the short bit.ly address, hopefully, uh, Digital Resources MM. And, you can access that uh, and that goes right to our resource page but you uh, resource tab within the website page but you can see that there's a lot more going on there and um, and hopefully you'll have time to explore it a little bit more um, talking a little bit right off the bat here about uh, some of the data that we've acquired uh, through the years um, you know, we, we look at um, instructor self-efficacy towards it, um, those educational technology. Um, we provide a pre and post test and that happens at the beginning of the year. So you'll be getting one of these uh, shortly to, to complete. Um, and at the end of the year, um, really what we're looking for are your confidence levels, your current confidence levels, and then later, because that will be tied into your uh, professional development needs. And as we find out those needs, um, we uh, start to bring in that professional development um, wherever we can find it throughout the country, within Illinois, throughout, throughout the country, or if um, scale it can provide it. Uh, what we learned with some of the results, um, the confidence started high uh, because you're as, as, as teachers, uh, as directors, uh, as other staff uh, members in, in adult education, your confidence is always high, right? So um, the 10% um, uh, of the scale from one to five uh, was what, what, what we saw as we, we increased that uh, by 10%. The professional development needs were measured by whether it's a low priority, a high priority, or already skilled. So there was a high priority on many. Uh, that was the norm in our pretest. Um, everyone wanted to learn these. Uh, uh, different strategies or resources, but we also saw later on in the year an increase of by about eleven percent of already skilled responses at the end for the post test, which hopefully is is letting us know that uh, we got some of that professional development out there, or you were able to find it somewhere else and um, be able to become the already skilled in that particular area. Um, if you're interested, um, there is a link here. And once again, when you get this presentation to give you uh, an example of the instructor staff self-efficacy, and that's the pre-survey that I put in there. And the link is over to the right here where you see the little screen. Um, we also have a learner pre and post technology self-efficacy of both in English and in Spanish. Um, we look at uh, pre and post uh, at the beginning of of the term and at the end of the term, so it's three times a year in the project year. Um, varied questions. We have, uh, uh, I have, I have used type of questions. Uh, do you know type of questions? And I expect to uh, 
you know, use or mm -hmm. um, use um, the particular skills in a particular area, whether it's contextualized or within your everyday life. Um, increase of, we saw that an increase of 9% to about 15% in all categories. So the identification uh, increased, um, the use of various tech tools um, was, was pretty well noted uh, as we went through the year and working virtually that, that those confidence levels also increased, um, which is what we're looking for. Um, the over on the right, um, I've shared a um, pre-survey and a post-survey. Those These are just examples um, and you'll see the um, both the English and Spanish questions within there as well. And that's the two little screens over on the right. Um, core elements of the DLL, um, support of adult educators, uh, um, you know, effectively incorporating learning technology into the classroom and then using the subject matter experts and, and the curated uh, resources to help out. Um, a facilitated learning community um, for educators and administrators to, to support, advise, and learn from each other and from the resources they find valuable. Um, and when I'm talking about resources, I'm, I'm talking about the um, learning resources and, and also those tech tools that go with it. Um, capturing insights about the most effective digital tools, delivery models, support strategies, and which can then be shared uh, across the state of Illinois. And as I mentioned, uh, across the country, um, since I actually give um, um, presentations on uh, the Digital Learning Lab in, uh, throughout the country in, in many, many states, um, and they ask for it. So, they find it interesting. So um, hopefully we've, we're, we're helping to formulate something like this in, in other areas as well. Um, what we're looking for this year, we're, we're going to have 25 educators, hopefully five cohorts and five uh, educators in each. Um, we're looking at three sprints and you'll learn a lot about sprints in, in a little while. Um, what is a sprint? Well, it's, uh, it's a three to four month period where you could actually go in and, um, you know, reevaluate your hypothesis, your goals, your metrics, make those adjustments if certain things were supported. Um, and then, um, and then look through what uh, basically what you did through that sprint time. Um, subject matter experts, um, they support the cohorts, they guide participant through the experimentation process, and so, so much more um, that it would not fit on this slide. Um, Participant educators, uh, they act as entrepreneurs, research uh, digital tools and, and experiment with a range of technologies in the classroom. Um, and hopefully um, those of you that are new um, can reach out to those that have been in the uh, DLL before and, and, and find out that these things really do happen and, and what uh, DLL has done to, to change their program. Um, for the better, of course. Um, help adult learners become more confident in using technology both uh, within and beyond the classroom, and then reimagine their roles as innovators and become technology advocates who support future professional development at all the local, at, at the local level, but uh, what I meant to say is far beyond the local level. And, and we have a, a number of, of, of um, proof positive with those um, throughout the, um, many of our past winners. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to share this quick video and, and then to turn it over um, to um, Women Employed, um, Ann Darton, who's here to, as our guest speaker. And, and this video was, was shared by uh, our, one of our great subject matter experts, uh, Joy Pack, in, in a past presentation. And I've been using it since because it, it, it really, uh, talks about our, our project um, and um, how we, we work as a team. Um, so here we go, I'm gonna play it. Hopefully everyone can hear it. There's a lot we can learn about teamwork from a rather surprising source. When geese migrate, they form a V-shape. Whilst it looks pretty, it also has some important functions in terms of working as a group. When flying in a V formation, each member of the team creates an uplift for the team member behind. This team effort makes the flight of the whole group more efficient. If a goose breaks free from the V shape, it will immediately have to make more effort to keep up. So working in a team towards the same destination 
means less effort needs to be made as an individual. And the same goose doesn't always lead the V-shape. Leadership rotates so that the burden of flying in front is shared. Again, this makes the whole flock more efficient. The geese flying behind encourage the front geese to keep up their speed by honking. This communication affects the whole team and their positive feedback makes the whole team more successful. Lastly, if a goose gets sick and falls out of formation, two others will stay with it until it is well enough to join another flock. The team cares for one another as a loss to the flock is a loss for all of them. So, to recap, working as a team is more efficient than working alone. Leadership can be shared for greater efficiency and to spread the burden. Communication with the whole team is important. Giving encouraging feedback promotes success and having empathy for team members is always better than taking a selfish approach. I love that video. Uh, it says a lot about our project and hopefully you all will be able to experience that as we go on through the year. I'm gonna stop sharing, Anne, and uh, you can take it over. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. Looks like I can. Um, hopefully every, everyone can see my presentation. Yep, looks good, Anne. All right, thanks. So first of all, thank you so much, Michael and Digital Learning Lab. I'm learning myself to say DLL and Scale It for inviting women employed to be part of today's launch. I am very excited to be here. Um, although I do see some people here could, who could give this presentation themselves, which is also kind of exciting. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with Career Foundations, um, I would like to acquaint you with a career exploration and goal setting curriculum that just might be a possible option that some of you may want to use for this project because you will be di building digital literacy while also providing students with information that will really help them plan a good future. For those of you who don't know what Career Foundations is, it's a short course that helps participants develop a career pathway that leads to sustainable careers strategically using their current program, um, whether that be adult education or workforce development as an on-ramp. And this was developed through a partnership between Women Employed and City Colleges of Chicago. Actually, now I'm with Women Employed as a consultant, but at the time that we developed this, I was with City Colleges of Chicago and Scale Lit, uh, back then, the Chicago Citywide Literacy Coalition was one of our original partners and advisors in, in doing this work. So anyway, this curriculum is designed to plug in anywhere alongside what you are already teaching your adult students. And with today's emphasis on career pathways, we considered it extremely important to get students into a career pathway program that was right for them, not just something that was good, but something that was right for the individual. Um, and this was, by the way, designed to be appropriate for ABE low intermediate and up, or and or ESL high intermediate and up. So a huge shout out to Jennifer Madrell and also Jeff Gumas for their amazing work in helping us at Women Employed to adapt our existing Career Foundations curriculum in a really brilliant way so that it could be taught online. And in a little bit, I'm going to show you just a quick glimpse of the real curriculum. We don't have a lot of time today, but uh, just so you can see it, but to just kind of give you an overview of what the digitized curriculum does, it's extremely flexible. It can be taught in person. It can be taught in a hybrid setting. Um, it can be taught fully remotely. Um, we had one teacher in a snowstorm who successfully um, had one group at home and uh, who couldn't make it in and one group in person. And he's projecting both to the uh, people at home and the people in the classroom. So it's extremely flexible. It can be used for synchronous or asynchronous learning. You can assign um, 
activities out of the classroom. You can do activities together. It's based completely on Google Docs and Slides, so you don't need any special software or anything like that. It can be used in a Google Classroom, but uh, doesn't have to be. Most users are not using it in a Google Classroom. It has three components, and I will briefly show you those shortly. It has an instructor guide that is the key to the kingdom because it has absolutely everything within it, all the links to, um, to everything else that you will need to teach the curriculum right there for you, along with teaching instructions. There are lesson slides that totally coordinate to the instructor guide, but are projectable. So whether you're projecting uh, via Zoom or project, projecting on a whiteboard, um, the slides are really a wonderful instructor tool. And then of course, student guides um, that are worksheets that can be used with every single lesson. And uh, the icing on the cake, again, thanks to Jennifer and Jeff, um, we have a companion technology integration toolkit for teachers, which I will also briefly show you. Every single lesson in Career Foundations has a technology integration suggested with the idea that, hey, maybe you're not going to use that technology integration with that lesson. You might use it with a different lesson. And frankly, if you have this toolkit, you might be finding yourself using it for other things that you teach as well. It's just a very rich resource. And just a comment that just as with the old career foundations, this is not something for independent self-paced learning. You don't just give the student a link and say, hey, go do this curriculum. It's highly interactive. It's student-centered. It's something um, where the teacher is a facilitator or a coach and the students really learn a lot from each other. So if you're using this as part of DLL, you, um, I'm pretty sure you're not going to have time to teach the entire curriculum as part of this project, but I just wanted to give you the big overview of what, what is in the curriculum. Um, so very briefly, it raises self-awareness um, of regarding skills, interests, values, and financial goals. It helps students match skills, interests, and values with career clusters. Now, it says here they learn about city colleges of Chicago focus areas and career pathways, but that part is very easily swapped out for your local community colleges programs, um, and that is done all the time. Um, students practice basic presentation skills to articulate their skills, interests, and chosen uh, focus areas or programs of study. They learn about support services at can keep them on track as they go through their career pathway. Um, finally, they choose a focus area or program of study at uh, their local community college. It might be a job training program, might be a college basic or advanced certificate. And very importantly, they come away with a plan and a timeline to get to either college or job training, whatever they are going to, to do next. So if you might want to consider using this digitized curriculum for a sprint project, of course, you are, um, I'm assuming, not looking at using the entire curriculum. And frankly, the programs in our consortium that use career foundations do customize it each in their own way. And one program actually distilled uh, key components of the curriculum into a two-hour workshop, which uh, is pretty amazing, but they did it. So for purposes of our discussion today, I wanted to show you that these are units or lessons um, that really contain high priority components. And these are the ones you may want to look at if you're considering using career foundations uh, as part of your DLL work. So lesson three, four, five, six, 10, and 20 are, are super important ones that would include goal setting and planning for potential difficulties that could throw you off track, discovering skills you already have, which you may not be aware of, learning about your personality traits and your values and matching them to career clusters and employers, learning about locally available careers, including short-term training uh, opportunities and creating a personal career or training education plan. 
oh, by the way, the course, um, the curriculum has a course outline right in the front that could actually help you decide which pieces you might want to use if you're contemplating using this uh, for a DLL project. So now, uh, let's see if I can somehow get to the controls here, my tabs, here we go. Um, hopefully, let me get back to the top here. Um, we're looking at the actual curriculum and I'm going to give you a link to, to, uh, to get to this curriculum yourself. And when you get to it, you're going to want to go to file, uh, make a copy, and you're gonna make a copy on your own Google Drive because you certainly are not gonna to want to be altering the women employed um, read-only copy. Um, and you'll want to open the, the um, this navigation panel so that you can easily navigate to any parts of the curriculum that you might want to use. Um, I do want to show you um, in the introduction, there's a sort of a scope and sequence chart that might help you customize and choose the lessons that you might want to adopt for this project if you do use it. I'm just going to go very quickly. This is gonna be really whirlwind because I know um, you have a lot of other things to look at today. But I'm going to show you, an ex as an example, lesson four, the skills you use now. And just like every other lesson at the beginning, you see what the learning objectives are. So you know what it is you're going to be teaching. You see a list of four lesson materials that you will need. And underneath, you'll see all the teaching instructions. However, however, um, what I want to do is show you, I have now switched over to the lesson four um, lesson slides. These are the projectable lesson slides that you might use with your class. And this is a, a particular activity I'm showing you, work, family, and community roles. And here you can conduct classroom activities and you could actually type into these boxes, but I hope you can see what I'm showing you. I'm actually expanding the notes portion of this slide. And here are all the teaching notes that are exactly the same as they are in the instructor guide. And if you are using presenter view to present this to your class, you don't have to keep going back and forth to, to the instructor guide because you can reference the teaching notes while you are actually showing the slide, which is extremely cool. And I'm about to hop over to the student guide, student worksheet. So here's the student version uh, with a little bit of instructions and the students can actually type into these spots here. So you could assign this as homework, the students could do it in class in a computer lab. It's really phenomenal the versatility um, that you find in this curriculum. But I want to go back to the instructor guide very quickly and show you um, that in the navigation panel, I hope you can all see this. I'm, my cursor is pointing at this little computer uh, icon that shows a technology integration activity. And every lesson has technology integration. This particular lesson has one that you're probably already using with your students, which is use the text chat feature in a video meeting to facilitate sharing and comparing them among students. We just use the text chat feature today in our meeting. Uh, but if I click on this, and I am actually going to expand this, I am now in the technology integration toolkit itself. And just randomly, uh, because this is probably an activity your students already do using check text chat feature. Um, I think I'll go to lesson 23. 
where the technology integration is a little bit more challenging. Use an online group discussion to have students share and compare ideas with other students when out of class. Um, what is so cool about these is that each one gives you the activity overview. They tell you what it is you're going to be doing as far as building digital literacy, why you would be doing it, how, in this case, it's a suggested activity with Flipgrid, tells you how to get to Flipgrid and figure out what you would be doing with it. And it tells you a little bit about the digital lit literacy skills. Um, and it even talks about posting on social media and a little bit of a discussion about what you do and don't post on social media. So this is um, absolutely invaluable. And I'm just going to show you my last slide. Uh, because here you have a QR code that would allow you to request the digitized curriculum yourself if you wanna take a look at it, if you wanna take a look at the technology integration toolkit also, um, just click on this and request your copy. And also, um, since this was such a whirlwind tour, for those of you who are new to Career Foundations, if you would like to contact me, I I'm happy to give you more information. Um, after I stop sharing my screen, I'll put my contact information in the, the uh, chat. And I guess that is about it. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, if anyone has any questions, Michael, I don't know if we have time for questions. You have to advise us on that. Yeah, we're just just for time's sake. But what what I did want to mention is that um, the uh, hopefully there's interest. I, I know that there, there will be. Uh, there's a number of us on here that have actually been in the program before, um, and we're successful as well with their learners. Um, and then of course Jennifer uh, was in the development of the. Um, the virtual part of this. Um, the, um, so um, this is just one of um, a few what can hopefully become um, maybe side cohorts um, and and to working on a particular um, pro program like um, uh, the Career Foundations. Um, so please, um, as we, we start our year and, and start our first monthly uh, cohort meetings, um let's think about this and 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 see what uh what you might think after you look over some of the information that Ann shared with us um there'll be there'll be some other opportunities as well last year we we well actually the last two years we were um very successful in having um a, a cohort working in a particular on a particular project or um a particular platform for example burlington english had uh, a, a very successful cohort um and and the, what was nice about the cohort is they weren't only using uh burlington english they were bringing in some of the engagement tools and learning how to use uh stuff like padlet and nearpod and jamboard and all of this and, and miro and incorporating it into the use of the main uh, Burlington English platform. This year, I'm in uh, conversations with uh, Essential Ed and, and also uh, New Readers Press. And as as we learned a little bit about the um, Career Foundations, uh, so these are all possibilities. Um, obviously, uh, you get some free material. You learn a lot more. Um, you definitely um, have the ability to bring in uh, more resources into your uh, repertoire as you. Uh, as you start working with your learners. So I thank you very much, Anne, for being here and, and letting us know about what I know is, is, is a great program. Thank you, Michael, and thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, you Anne. If you want to stick around, um, folks have been pretty quiet in the text chat. I just wanted, this is Jennifer, I just really wanted to um, let everyone know I'm completely fine with folks putting uh, comments and questions in the text chat as I'm speaking. So if you have questions specific for Anne, we did run a little short on time. Feel, please feel free to use the text chat to ask Anne any questions. 
Um, and so with that, let's let's get into my part. So um, as Michael said, um, the subject matter experts here on the project are here to help you. And so we've worked together preparing for today to um, really turn this over to you. This really is not a top down project. This is about ideas being generated from participants and taking it through this experimental process. Um, so as I said, please, um, for those that have been on the project before, if anything I say sparks an idea that you want to share with some of those that are newer, that's really the spirit of what we're trying to do today is really share ideas and ideate. And so that's what I'm my uh, my role here today in my section is to talk about generating ideas that we can carry through in our projects. So we have a lot of folks that um, have been through the introdu introductions have been with the DLL for um, for some time and love to see all the new faces. So I'm, I'm assuming at this point of the process, um, as we're here today, the idea of a sprint is kind of this black black box. Maybe you have some vague idea of what it is, but really what our role is going to be from um, now till, till the end of our session today is to really help you get your head around what a sprint is and how you can kind of take this idea of creating an experimental project and making it your own. And so as Michael has uh, mentioned before, the, our idea is to create and test um, an instructional strategy or a learning approach that in may, some way, shape, or form would incorporate technology or utilize some type of di digital resources. That's that's kind of our, um, that's what we're working in the, the type of project we're, we're focused on. And so some of the things we're talking about today may sound familiar from other work you've done. So for example, if you've done any type of action research in the past, um, if you've done any type of technology integration projects, certainly those educators who work through the pandemic, I think you're going to hear a lot of things we talk about today that are like, wow, I did a sprint during the pandemic and didn't even really call it that as you were quickly mi migrating your classes to an online format. And then there's also this concept that's out there in the real world called design sprints. And um, I'm going to share very briefly um, some information. I'll set, put, set a link in the chat real quick if I can walk and shoot gum here. There you go. Um, so there actually is a book out there in the world um, about sprints. And so in particular, and this isn't certainly anything you need to, um, to purchase, but um, Google Ventures, yes, that Google, um, when they um, piloted new tech um, technologies or um, or new approaches, they have put together over the years a sprint process that involves designing, prototyping, testing, and evaluating ideas. And we borrow a lot of those types of things and those approaches in, in what we do here in the sprint. And so my colleagues who are gonna follow after are really gonna get into the details of what a sprint process is, but I wanted to give you on one screen a high level overview of what this is all about. So at least you have one place um, to kind of refer to that tells you what a sprint process is all about. And I'm going to kind of build this out as I talk. So everything begins really with your needs and your goals. So everyone that's um, gone through the introductions, you can tell we have um, folks in different roles ranging from maybe tech integration coordinators to um, educators who uh, teach on a regular basis to admins. And so everybody, depending on where you're coming from, are going to have your own unique set of needs or problems or challenges. And, and I actually like to think about it more in terms of opportunities of things that you, you, you want to do. And so those are very closely aligned then with your goals. So you're kind of where you are now and you're thinking about looking out into the future. Again, this, the duration of a sprint is, a, is three to four months. So where would you like to take your learners? Where would you like to take the, the teachers you're working with if you're in an admin role? And so based on what you come up with, and again, those are going to be all over the place, um, depending on what your, your interests and needs are, you're going to come up with a potential strategy that you want to test out. And so this um, strategy or approach is going to be tied again to those needs or goals. And then given this is the, uh, the DLL, the goal here is that you're going to figure out some way to support that using technology or a, or a digital resource. So where, where I'm now going to just very quickly go through, I'm going to start laying out some terminology that's familiar to those who've been in DLL before, but will be fairly new for, um, for those that aren't. Um, we start our process, and we're going to spend a lot of time in this during our breakouts, um, thinking about uh, what is your prediction of how this strategy or approach that you're going to implement, what is, what's, what's going to be the outcome of that? And so once you implement your sprint, 
you're, what you're really doing is you're building or creating, as Ann mentioned, maybe you're going to take a section of career foundations and you're going to pilot that with a group of students, for example. So you're going to try that out and you're going to somehow figure out a way to incorporate technology or a digital resource as part of that. So after you've gone through this and you've, you've done your implementation, um, a big part of what we do is evaluate to what extent did your prediction that you laid out in your hypothesis come true. And so Michelle and Joy are going to spend quite a bit of time with us in a moment talking about metrics. And so those are, uh, in a nutshell, the measurements you use to uh, to test your hypothesis. Did, did things work out the way you thought? So this is what a sprint looks like all on one page. What I'm going to spend a little bit of time and I'm going to ask um, for those, like, like I said, I'm going to call on you virtually, if you could, in the text chat, those that have been with the, um, the DLL in the past, to help me think through and describe the types of strategies and the types of um, sprints that you have worked on in the past. And this is what I'm going to spend my time on. So let's, let's I'll share some examples. And like I said, feel free to use the text chat, um, those that have been in the, in the project before, to share some of the projects you've worked on. So as I said, everything starts with this idea of a, an opportunity or a need that you're working on. And then from that, we develop our solutions. And we'll spend a lot of time in our co individual cohorts talking through this process. So to give you an idea of what, where things have come from in the past, as I said, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of educators moving from face to face to, to remote. And now that we're kind of coming out on the other side of the pandemic, folks are still retaining some of those hybrid or blended instructional models. And so there was a lot of redesign of activities. So things that you like to do in your traditional face-to-face -face classroom, and now you're moving it and migrating it to that remote or online environment. So example, for example, using Jamboard versus a chalkboard, how you could you know, reach, rechange those uh, and, and redesign those activities into something you can do online. Um, Angelique's not here today, but she had the opportunity to partner with a business. Uh, she works at a community college that they wanted to integrate some type of virtual reality training. So that's kind of on that other side of the, well, if you look at the continuum of projects you, you could use, that's kind of on the, the more challenging and more pioneering side of things. And so she piloted um, a virtual reality um, curriculum with a group of um, her target audience learners that might one day, you know, use this as part of a larger project within her college. Um, certainly, we've mentioned several times, and, and even in introductions, folks mentioned um, students lacked um, the digital literacy skills to even be able to use the educational technology that we are trying to introduce and use in the classroom. And so lots of the projects folks work on um, focus on that. And one of the most um, uh, interesting and exciting ones from, from the last DLL, I think a lot of folks picked up on this, is creating um, a technology boot camp, and so it was like a way to onboard students on how to use technology before you even began to use it in the classroom. Um, another thing that comes up in, in uh, working now largely online or having remote students is how do you track their projects. So that was a very interesting um, approach where someone had uh, created exit tickets and a, and a lesson schedule. So as folks are going through this online or remote pro, um, process and it's hard to track their work, they believe it was Google Forms they used as a way to just have a student kind of check in and check out uh, when they were done with projects. Um, and so one thing I just wanted to mention is um, folks are, um, as you hear today, as people are starting to tell you what their strategies are and some of the solutions they worked on, technologies they worked on, it's really easy to get excited about, oh, I want to try that shiny new technology. And that's fantastic. That's what we're here to do. But all that we kind of ask and that I in particular find is most helpful for um, the folks that I work with is please make sure you're tying it to the reality of where you're coming from. So make sure it somehow is a need or an opportunity that's really um, resonates with you and your learners. It's going to make it a lot easier for you to go through that implementation process. It's going to be a lot um, uh, easier for you to bring that real world into the, into your sprint. Um, so definitely get excited about but what you hear, but always kind of keep that in mind of how and how would I bring this back into working with my with my learners. And so now what I want to do is um, introduce a template that we're going we're going to be using later on. We're going to have a breakout. And this really is now your, we're now pivoting to now talking about what we've done in the past to um, really getting your, giving you the chance to get your hands dirty and to think about um, what you want to create, what, what you want to do in your sprint. And so if you take, if you click on the link that I put in the chat room, you have a couple of options. Um, first of all, if you're familiar with Google and you have a Google account, 
Um, this is a template, so you can't edit this document. You're going to need to save a copy for yourself. So first off, if you could either um, save it as a Google Docs by copying it to your own Google folder, you do that by clicking File, Make a Copy. Your other option, if you're not familiar with Google, that's not an ecosystem you typically work in. If you want to download it to the device you're using, um, you can go ahead and do that by clicking uh, File and Download, and you'll have a couple options there. Um, so please check that out. And that we're, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to the next slide. Is later. that for? Go ahead, Monique. I was asking um, the, you said it was in the chat. It's two um, links there. Are we supposed to take both of those? Um, the one that says the Google template to make a copy, does that work for you? Yeah. Okay. Does that work for you? Thank you. Okay, great. And so if you do have any problems yeah. um, opening it, we will have a breakout and we can help you to get that open um, as well. But do let me know in the text chat if you have any trouble and I can I can help troubleshoot that when, when David's speaking. Um, and so just as you're, again, this whole idea of, uh, as I con conclude my, my remarks here, um, it, it sometimes is overwhelming to think of sprint ideas. Maybe you're at the point of going, I have a ton of ideas I want to try out, or maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum of saying, I really have no idea what I would test out um, within the sprint. So here's some things to kind of get you to get you to into a box so that you might um, have some ideas of what you might want to work on. So one of the places I'd like you to start thinking about is why did you join the lab? Did you hear about some projects other folks had worked on? Was there something in the marketing materials about the lab that sounded interesting, the technologies or the resources? Kind of focus in on that. If that interested you enough to join the lab, maybe that's something that could be fodder for your project. Are there technologies you want to try? Um, as Ann just talked about, um, there was career foundations. We have had a lot of folks in the past interested in uh, incorporating Burlington English. So kind of think about, are there specific learning resources or platforms that you're interested in? Are there specific strategies or approaches you want to try? So maybe there's some, some approach that you've watched another teacher try, but you just haven't had the chance to try that in your own classroom. This is a great time to do that. Are there any other questions you have that you want answered that, again, we don't, we're very busy, we all have a million things on our plate. Well, this is your time to kind of step back and use this as your excuse to try something out. And as this is a perfect transition as I, I pivot and hand things off to David Rosen, he really talks a lot about hunches. So as educators, there's certainly a lot of times you're like, oh, I think if I just could do this with my students, I think it would make an impact. And so those are the types of things that we're really interested in and in, in you trying to think about as ideas for your projects. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to David to take us through the details of um, setting a hypothesis on your metrics. Great, thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, next slide, please. So here's a brief outline of what I'm gonna be talking about over the next maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes at the most, uh, just to give you an idea. <clears throat> next slide, please. So what is a learning lab? particularly for folks here who are new. Um, and this is from my perspective. Uh, I see it as a professional development model. And so it offers you an opportunity to experiment, to test out your hypotheses, or as Jennifer rightly said, hunches about what would be effective instruction. Uh, some people uh, regard this as a professional development opportunity. Um, that the sprints really are a structured way for you to go deeply into something that's important to you. Some people would describe this, particularly from a research perspective, as teacher research or classroom action research, both of which we have um, a good history of in our field. And a learning lab's primary purpose is to help you develop, if, particularly if you're a teacher, uh, but also if you work with teachers. Uh, to develop the skills and knowledge that you need to base your decisions and base them on evidence and evidence that you are in charge of so that it really matches what it is you're trying to learn. And <clears throat> often um, some of that evidence is from your own systematic, and that's the key word here, systematic observation or measurement, uh, and that includes even formal assessments. Um, and what you're trying to do is to find out if your hypothesis is correct or not, 
um, or if a uh, if your hypothesis actually needs to be changed and and retested in a upcoming sprint. Next slide, please. So what's a digital learning lab? Very simply, um, its focus is on teachers and learners using digital technology. And that includes hardware and software for instruction. It also includes uh, approaches that uh, are very much uh, dependent on uh, technology of various kinds. Next slide. So sprint, we've used this word. What does sprint, what, what does sprint mean? And actually it means a couple of different things that I see as um, overlapping. Typically they're 12 to 16 weeks. And as I mentioned, it's an opportunity to conduct a, an experiment, it, a class experiment, but I'm defining a class as taking place poten potentially uh, in person, traditionally, online entirely, or hybrid, which includes both online and in person. And a sprint is in every case driven, driven by a hypothesis. That is a hunch. It's a teaching approach or strategy, hunch. What, what from your experience as an instructor or working with instructors seems to be true, uh, but you'd really like to dive deep into it and find out more about for whom it's true and under what circumstances and when it is and when it might not be true. So it grows out of informal experimentation and observation by you. And that observation, and I just wanna undermine this because some people think, oh, you're talking about research, you must be talking about standardized tests and standardized tests may be useful to you but there's a wide range of other kinds of non-formal assessments. Um, and that absolutely includes observation, but you wanna do very carefully designed observation, systematic observation, observation that's going to be aligned with what you're trying to learn about your hypothesis. So that means it includes existing resources, uh, assessment resources, evaluation resources, but it also can include new relevant metrics or formal observation uh, to determine if the hypothesis is correct or not. It includes reflection and evaluation. It includes developing findings or drawing conclusions about whether the hypothesis appears to be correct or not. And it also includes communicating the results. Next slide, please. So what, what is a sprint hypothesis? This is a long Greek word. And uh, as you know, I prefer the word hunch sometimes. Uh, and when you take your hunch and you put it in a statement that enables you to find out um, whether you're on the right track, then you have a hypothesis. So it's a tentative, measurable, or observable prediction statement about what will happen using a particular instructional strategy, or some people prefer intervention in a, and this is really important, in a particular kind of class, level of class, and under particular circumstances. If it's too broad, you're not likely to have a very clear answer about the effectiveness of your, of your hypothesis with that population. So here are two examples for you. Uh, I think examples particularly in, of hypotheses uh, can say a lot more than I can say. So just read those for a second before we move on. Assuming you've had enough time, but if you haven't, these slides you know are all going to be available. You can come back to these. These are actual um, examples from previous sprints. Next slide, please. So how are you going to develop a hypothesis? So very often, this is what teachers do. It's not the only thing they do, but it'll at least give you uh, some ideas. 
Sprints often begin with an instructional problem or challenge. Something that you may have experienced already with your students and has puzzled you, persistently puzzled you, and it, that you've been thinking about because it's happened more than once. And you have a hunch about what might solve that problem. And this is your opportunity to the DLL to find out. You may have in mind a particular question, for example, about the effectiveness of a new instructional strategy or approach that you would like to study. You may have read about something that works in K through 12 or in higher ed. And you wonder, I think this might work with my students. So here's a perfect thing for you to try as your hypothesis with your students. And you may be intrigued, for example, about an instructional theory that you studied uh, when you were uh, a graduate student or, or that you've recently learned about in a professional development webinar. And you wanna test that out and you wanna test it out with your students to see if it applies with them. Next, next slide, please, Jennifer. Okay, I'm not gonna go into depth here because uh, we have the great privilege of having two of our colleagues, Joy and Michelle, who are gonna drill down on this, but um, this is what I think about it. First of all, what does metrics mean? Measures or tools for measuring. And they should help you to know if your hypothesis is correct. They can include formal, as I mentioned, or non-formal measurement or observation tools, standardized assessments, surveys. Actually, surveys are a very powerful way to do this. And particularly if you haven't used a Google form, maybe that would be a good tool to introduce your students to, um, to do some of the surveys, particularly obviously if it's going to be online. Questionnaires uh, include, I should have mentioned earlier, by the way, oral surveys, particularly you wanna use oral surveys with uh, beginning level English language learners. Direct observation checklists. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Oral interviews and reviewing learner produced documents or digital presentations that they've done using a set of evaluation, I'm sorry, uh, digital presentations that you have done using a set of evaluation rubrics as they're called, suitable to assessing the document or presentation and more. These can be assessments, uh, metrics that already exist, or you can make them. Next slide. I think that was the last slide, but I do have some comments uh, before we get into the brainstorming. I just wanna comment that I think Jennifer, in addition to being a, a wonderful moderator of slides here, uh, has, I, in my view, has really brilliantly uh, described a sprint from a design perspective. But it's also um, a research perspective. And it has a rich tradition of action research or teacher research or classroom research. And it's, it's really both. And uh, some of you will be more drawn to the design perspective, which is fine. Some of you may be more drawn to the research perspective, or some of you may want to integrate both. Uh, I also want to underline that the purpose here is not to prove no one expects you to prove a hypothesis. Some, some people think, well, if we test it, that means we have to prove it. Not at all. The idea is to test out whether or not it's true. And ideally, uh, this would be whether or not it's true for a particular po population under particular circumstances. Not that it's true for all students for all time and in all locations. So you might find, for example, that your hypothesis suggests that the strategy or approach that you're interested in is not promising, or at least not promising to those students or to that kind of student or level of student. So that's fine. You don't have to, you have to, you don't have to be right about your hypothesis. Ideally, you would want to be right, because you would want to know that something you think is promising is, is correct but you don't have to. 
So even if you have evidence that it is effective, that may be only with one group. And if you test it out, let's say in more sprints and in sprints that go beyond your participation in the digital learning lab, you will get more and more evidence about the range of students and levels that this particular strategy is effective with. So you can be very precise. Uh, it, it worked, it worked for these students under these circumstances, that's fine. So long-term, what, what this is about, I think, is it's an opportunity for you as a teacher to really know what strategies and what approaches are effective in helping your students learn. And if you get a new group of students, if you're teaching a new subject area, uh, you'll have to do that again because you can't rely on what you've learned about teaching with the previous group of students you've worked with or, or type or level. So you're trying to learn if your, your hypothesis is, shall I say, promising and uh, likely to be effective. And if you use this way of looking at teaching, and if you're getting data from testing out your strategies, I think, and I, I think some of my colleagues would agree with this, you're gonna be a better teacher over time because you're gonna be systematic about what works and what doesn't work and with whom. And ultimately, um, you're probably going to find from this kind of uh, systematic study that you have learned some best practices over time and you'll be able to recommend them to your colleagues uh, as well as uh, have them work with your learners, which is the most important thing. Uh, and who knows, maybe you'll be able to write a journal article about some of the strategies that you've tested uh, in an adult literacy education journal or a co journal, uh, if that's something that you're interested in. So I'd like to stop there. I don't know if we have time for questions about this. Do we, uh, Michael or Jennifer? Are we doing on time, Michael? Um, we, we have time for some questions. Okay. So you can, un you can unmute yourself if you'd like, or you can put them in the chat. If they're in the chat, I'll answer them in the chat if I can. Or, or any of our colleagues here, our subject matter experts can answer them. Uh, I will say while, while we're waiting to see if there are any questions, that if you are new and you are finding that you're already overwhelmed <laughs> with information, uh, including the information that I just presented, uh, I'm not. I would not be surprised. Uh, you will have the slides. You can come back to them. You do have a subject matter expert team leader with you, um, and um, this will, in a in a few weeks or months at the most, be um, much more sensible to you. You'll understand what's going on. I I know that for some people who are new, that this can be a heavy lift. Okay, and please do um, add your, if you don't have any questions that you want to ask um, using your mic, feel free to ask them in the text chat. You know, we're, it's our first meeting, so folks may be a little more uh, hesitant to, to speak up, but please do. It's, um, it's really your, your opportunity to, to um, start framing your project. Um, so with that, um, the next thing we're going to do is give you now the chance to really roll up your sleeves um, Michael is going to, in a moment, um, randomly assign us to breakout rooms. So these are not the folks you'll be working with in your cohort, um, but it's just for us to give us each other a chance to um, meet different people. Maybe it'll be folks you'll work with ultimately in your cohort, which we'll meet at the end of, of, of our meeting today, um, but possibly it's somebody that you won't really be working with the rest of the sprint. Um, in, in, in a specific sprint, but it just gives you a chance to share and compare ideas. And really what we're going to do is use that Google template um, that I shared a moment ago. And I just put the, the link again in the, the text chat if you didn't have a chance to click through and go through these items that are on the right side of the screen that David and I have been sharing, talking about 
really what is important to you? What are some of the things and opportunities, the things that you would love to try out as part of a sprint? And thinking through that, what are your goals associated with that? Um, and, and so on. And so we're going to take a, a chance to do that, like I said, in a, in a small breakout. But before we go into that, I do want to give, um, it looks like, Jose, you had a question. Did you want to go ahead and ask that to David? Yes, yeah. Um, this question is in regards to um, the hypothesis. Um, and, and my question is, um, since five team members are here in the DL, L uh, group. Um, my question is that uh, if the hypothesis should be unique for an instructor class, um, an organization, a program, should that hypothesis be um, tailored for one specific uh, class or uh, should we set up a, a hypothesis as a group in, yeah. in, uh, for Erie That's House? A that's a, a very helpful question. Um, and I'm sure many people, particularly many people who are new, uh, might have that question. So thank you for asking it. The answer is it depends on your group. Uh, the, in some groups, they do a group hypothesis, some teams. Um, in others, they do individual hypotheses. And it's even possible, if you wish, to do an individual hypothesis and a group hypothesis. And you can change how you're doing that every sprint. So you have three sprints. You might decide the first sprint. Um, let's, we're not sure yet if we wanna do a group hypothesis and all do individual hypothesis. And that could be the same all the way through the three sprints. In the second hypothesis, however, you might say, oh yeah, you know, we're all doing something that's very similar. Let's, we really do have a group hypothesis. So why don't we, you know, together, see what we're finding out from doing a group hypothesis or any variation on that. So a lot of freedom to decide how you want to do it within your team. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Michael, did you want to kind of get us through the logistics of getting into our breakout groups? Yes, so we're currently assigning uh, people to breakout rooms. Um, so you'll, you'll see that come up there. Um, if there are any other questions and maybe you might need some help opening up the template, um, please let us know. We wanna make sure that everyone has the template open. And this is hopefully what you see when you see it. And as I mentioned, if you go to file here, you'll have the option to make a copy. If you have a Google account already, or if you want to download it, you can download it into these formats to use uh, on your own device, whichever. Okay, so are we ready to go into our rooms? Okay. If I if I missed anybody, I'll get you into a room. Don't worry about that. And um, so here we go. Okay, I'm gonna start to open the rooms. Jose, did you get one yet? No, no yet. Okay, let me make sure here. Okay, who do I have left out here? So Jose's got one. Renuka, did you want to go into a room? Okay, cool.
we were back first. Our group wins. <laughs> It's funny, I was just going to say my thought is, and then suddenly I, nope, that thought's gone. <laughs> wow, didn't finish. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for participating in that. Um, I went from room to room at some great conversation um, and um, it was, was recorded on the template as well. So I, I know that the recordings only last for as long as the, the host is in the, the breakout rooms, but, yeah. um, but we definitely got some, some, some great ideas, um, not only in the, in the template, but as, as we were going around recording. Um, so do we want to continue or uh, actually let's take a break. Let's take a, a 10 minute break. We're a little past the, the, that mark. Um, if I could, we'll, we'll start again at 2.30 and then we'll, we'll finish up uh, with our breakout groups and whatever other information we need to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, this is for an well, this is a, a statewide so and we like part. So I'm just throwing out ideas, but I don't know if that's what I want to do. Not, you know, I'm hoping that this person, you know, I'm going to help out and work with me on that side. You know, you know, I have a little bit of 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 a little
Michael, uh, you're muted. Yes. I'm wondering how are you going to, or how is somebody going to bring all of these ideas together into one document? Well, we'll have to work on that afterwards. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, right if you decide to do that, um, yeah. I created this document. I'll put it in the chat for you right now. In fact, it's in the chat already um, that you can access and I can give you editing uh, privileges if you want. And well, it's, it's what our group came up with. Great. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, okay. All and maybe first. others, other groups did too. I don't know. They well, did. Maybe not. They did. did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, um, let's let's get started. Um, and uh, I believe Joy, Michelle, are you going to go over your section or? Okay. Um, I did send out a, a chat. If you could take a look at it, just uh, to gauge on time here to get people to the breakout group so they know their cohorts and so on, and then just discuss to take us out of the of the event today. Um, so, um, okay, cool. Let's do it. Yeah, all of this is important as we meet later in our cohorts. Obviously, all of this discussion is, is very important. Uh, your breakouts that you just had, all of that was uh, super important and uh, very informative. So, um, let me go back to the presentation here and get everybody started. Okay, uh, Joy, Michelle, you ready? Yeah. Cool, thank you. Next slide. Next one. So just summarizing, um, sort of like hopefully you had some really good breakout um, groups with your um, SME. And these are like the, the next step is probably to formulate your hypothesis. So everyone knows um, what their needs are, whether it's in their classroom or their program, and then what's your goal? So as you think about what do I want to get out of this by solving this solution, this problem or challenge is what kind of digital tools can I use, resources that are out there that I can get support with or use that could help you um, formulate your hypothesis. If you go to the next slide, you'll see um, a former participants hypothesis. I really like this because it includes all the three elements um, forming a really good hypothesis, the uh, problems and the challenge and the strategy they use and the goal they had. So in this one, the problem was that the teacher was using too much time teaching how um, students to use digital tools such as Zoom and Burlington English. Um, it just took so much time. So the strategy was to not have the teachers do it, but do a sort of orientation 
And that could also like make other students feel more comfortable. So then it would maximize their attendance and retention in class. And the goal was um, by doing all this, the goal would be that instructors will have more time to actually instruct the students in English class. So this one's a really good hypothesis. If you look on the next one, um, Michelle did this um, short video on talking about metrics. greatly apologize that my video editing skills aren't that great, but I tried uh, to throw something together where it wasn't just me talking at you for a minute or so. Um, I apologize. We're fostering a puppy and he's going back today. So he can tell something's up and he's like on this squeaky toy and is, I'm just glad that we don't have smell o vision because <laughs> he's super gassy. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I apologize for any noise or background noise that you might hear. Um, so Michael, if you go to the next slide, um, referring to those four tips for developing metrics, um, we have, well, before I get to this, the if you're interested in creating videos like that for your own classroom, um, the site that I used is Powtoon and they have a free, um, like a free subscription. It's not like one of those where you have to pay or like it's only temporary. Um, and you can actually have your own videos created off like PowerPoint style like that, but there's animations and things like that that you can also use. Um, and ultimately you can download it to a YouTube channel and share it with whomever. Um, so that's what I used to make that quick video. Um, for developing your metrics, the first point that I'd like to make is to use an assessment to determine where your students are at. So um, one tip is you can collect achievement scores or use demographics to better identify community needs for your um, subset of students. So that's just like an idea to get your get the ball rolling for you is create like a pre-assessment. Um, Moving into number two, um, that assessment that you create to collect achievement scores initially, as well as to collect demographics. Obviously, the demographics are likely not going to change unless they've like moved or something like that. Um, but for achievement scores, you can create a pre and post assessment to guide how um, you can improve performance. And that's something that I never thought about or like I didn't like silo these ideas into the four tips um, when I was in as a participant. So it was really difficult for me to like brainstorm and come up with my own metrics because I didn't know, there's just like a lot and you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, so like I said, the second tip, make sure that you're linking data across time. So you can see like before and after effects of whatever you're doing in your sprint. Um, number three, collect student satisfaction data. One metric could be a student satisfaction assessment. And again, you can link this over time. 
do pre and post and see like um, how do they like a certain tool at the beginning versus how do they like it at the end? Um, they might hate it at the beginning because it was really difficult for them to start learning how to use the tool. Um, but as they become familiar with it, they might really love it at the end or vice versa. Um, so that's another op or another option for a metric. And then lastly, um, you can connect data across content areas by evaluating teacher effectiveness. So we often think of metrics as things like that we're looking at like our students under a microscope, but you can actually create a metric for yourself or for like the general teacher population um, to determine like teacher effectiveness. And this can be done by students. It can be done by yourself as like a self-reflection at the beginning and at the end. Um, and again, link these things over time. So beginning versus end, how did you reflect or how did you feel about a specific topic? Um, and then lastly, for these four tips, you can use one of them and just like isolate and choose one of these metrics to, or like one of these ideas to help you like create your metrics, or you can use all four of them. So it's really nice that um, you have the opportunity to kind of do what you will and make this um, your own so you can get the most out of this project and the most out of this learning lab. Um, any questions so far? Um, Michael, did you want to go to the next slide, please? Joy, do you want to start off? Yeah, so here are samples of metrics that former um, participants had used in prior cohorts during our during the years of DLL. Um, the most popular is being surveys, um, whether it's created um, teacher created or um, a survey that um, Michael has sent. There's also um, a lot of people use pre and post standardized assessments. Um, whatever your program use, CASA's tape, North Star, um, to check whether these are effective means by seeing um, level gains in their testing. Also, formal or non formal measurements. You can use um, something from if you're using New Readers Press or Burlington English. Um, someone used typing.com to do a pre, like how did they do with their keyboarding skills for one minute? And then after a little bit, tested them like afterwards, like they improved or they didn't. And then things like um, reviewing learner produced document presentations, voice thread or having them create Google Slides. Um, I know um, there was a teacher who had um, their students create a Powtoon video um, about a certain um, assessment. So um, anything else to add, Michelle, that you can think of? Um, I think that I, I wanna piggyback this off of what David had said earlier, that um, these metrics that you create can be like a variety of different things where they're already pre-created or you create them yourself. Um, so that's really important to think of. People who have been in this project in the past um, likely have things that can, they can share with you. Um, and definitely your subject matter experts uh, have a wide assortment of resources that they can give you if you're not sure or like you just need to come up with and pinpoint what it is you're looking to assess. And we are glad to help you find that. There's some more examples on the next slide. Oral in self-reporting, oral interviews where the teacher interviews their students themselves and takes a tally, pre and post surveys. Going back to um, one of the metrics, developing metrics like um, the student satisfaction rate, pre and post as to how do they feel about using digital technology things like that, or specific reading levels, um, has it increased? So um, I think these are really good examples of metrics. And like Michelle had said that somebody has probably already done something similar to what you wanna do, and you may not 
it may not be necessary to create something straight from scratch. We could give you a template or a, a sample that you can make your own to tailor to your classroom or your program as well. And that's the that's it with our metrics. I know we're going to do our we're going to meet our cohorts um, on this. Wait, was there a question? Sorry, I don't have my chat up. Uh, yeah, Jennifer was just asking uh, for everyone if any of the past participants have suggestions of metrics that they've used as examples. That's a good question. Uh, we used forms, so our project was creating a phonics um, program that uses some that uses you know some digital interface, and so my my goal was to train my the volunteers working on the program with me to see if they had learned how to do to use Google Slides, how to use Kahoot, quizzes. So we did post and pre and post surveys about what they had learned and their on um, um and they all learned how to do like all this stuff. So it was really beneficial. And then we gave we finished the course and we did a pre and post survey of the students who took the course. And they also improved their levels on comprehension of phonics. So um, that was how we did it. And we used so, Google Forms. It was easy. <laughs> and some people put in a chat using DAISY attendance logs and using the diagnostic reports from Burlington English, which is um, a, a DLL favorite digital tool to use. So I use two things. Um, first, I use Google Slides um, as somewhat of a, you know, uh, performance based. So in the beginning of the um, semester, we had a, I, I created a slideshow presentation and each one had a slide. And by the end of the semester, they had to add information about their country. I had prompts on there. So it took all semester for them to add images. So that was what you know, I considered a performance based. And then we also, um, as a group, we created somewhat of a questionnaire and it was navigating through a website. Um, so we showed them a website and actually in the project that I just finished with Jennifer, um, we created a health literacy through Google site. So we were able to control the content. And so then asking questions either in a Google form or just, um, a document, they had to navigate through the website to answer some questions. So it was to determine if they could navigate through the website. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. That's that's great. Uh, some great information here. I uh, would like to go to the next step, though, and um, so you can meet your cohort members and uh, your subject matter expert. I've broken you up into uh, your, your breakout rooms, uh, your cohort breakout rooms, so we can discuss for the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes or so. Um, hopefully, uh, subject matter experts, you can start your, your notes for your cohorts. As I mentioned, there, there might be um, uh, minor adjustments um, um, later uh, as we bring on a, a few more um, organizations that are participants that are working on their paperwork and making sure about their availability and so on. But uh, right now, these are the cohorts that you're in, uh, the subject matter experts that you're working with. Uh, so if we're all ready, I'm going to send you off into your groups. I've also invited um, some of our scale it, um, my colleagues that are on the um, call here as well. If, if they're interested, they can, they can join. Um, and here I go. Let me know. Uh, well, I'll, I'll find out if someone did not get put in a group.
Jesse, did you receive yours? You might be able to just toss him in again. Yeah, I gotta toss him in again. No, he's not he's not coming up and on a sign. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just that he just hasn't joined. Jesse, did you get your your breakout room? Yeah, I don't think his connection's coming in very well. Mm, okay, yeah. Okay, it looks like he either signed out or <laughs> maybe one starting or got the link. Yeah. To a breakout room. I'm going to go and skip around to the breakout rooms, um, okay. record little parts of it because it will only record when I'm in there. So, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Thank you.
You want the phone number too? Sorry to my group. I'll get everyone's availability um, over the next day or two. Okay, welcome back. Uh, just our last few minutes here. Um, those are the groups that, as I mentioned at the beginning of our talk, I, I mean, I just got two texts from two other organizations mm -hmm. that, <laughs> is it too late? I got to, I got to send someone to you. <laughs> so um, where the, these groups are, 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 as they call them, the news fluid. Right? <laughs> so um, uh, we're going to um, uh, probably bring in another subject matter expert and, and I will, I will reach out to those that I'm even thinking of moving to the new subject matter to make sure it's okay with you. And then as we adjust this, okay. Um, if you didn't get your date down for either at the end of this month or the first week of November to get that first cohort meeting down, that's okay. I'm sure that the subject matter experts will follow up with you. I'll, I'll be part of that too. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as any other information, um, you know, I've got uh, notes from the meetings. I when it popped into every single one and and recorded some of it. Um, so uh, we'll we'll be in contact, and I'll get all that contact information out to every single one of your subject matter experts, your email and uh, your phone number, if you want to share that as well. Okay, so here's the list of, that I worked off of for now, as you can see here. Um, it, you know, it's it's, just, it, it's great to see these names here since I know so many of you or, or have heard about uh, your great work that you're doing back at your organization. Um, and it, it's it's such a wealth of, of, of the variety of programs that you come from. I, I mean, we even have someone here from one of our American job centers, which has always been a goal of mine. Um, so that's 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 awesome. Um, so just to end things up a little bit, um, those were our breakouts. Um, I, I've, I'm going to share this this uh, whole presentation with you, and it's right there. There's the the Bitly address and the QR code. So if you want to bring up um, the the that presentation, and you have access to all of this uh, information, of course, I will also share this presentation with you uh, when I send you your certificate sometime next week. Um, for participating in this as professional development, um, as well as um, I also have a little jam board here with some more questions. Um, and just to get to know a little bit more about you, and if you haven't used jam board, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to it. Um, but I will also bring this uh, as I come into your cohorts uh, for your first meeting and see if we can talk through this as well. Um, I do have a survey that I sent out at the beginning uh, with your um, contract information. Um, I will be sharing that again because that, that is a great starter survey. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, I, I will try to put these links in here unless someone else can for me. Um, if you can put those two links in there. Um, I will also put them in. Uh, well, I can't. So I just have one more thing for you to do for me. And, and that would be great if you can. Um, and once again, if you cannot do this because you, you know, because of the whatever with your phone and the QR code, I, I do have a, a survey that I would like for you to complete. And obviously, I will also send this out again for those that were not able to. But once again, just, you know, just using your phone, taking a picture of this, it's, it's uh, about 10 very simple questions uh, to find find out how can we improve these events in the future um, and and some other quick questions. Uh, thank you, Kay. Um, so there's um, the bit.ly there. Uh, and then, of course, there the, there's the presentation link and then the, the Jamboard link. Mm -hmm. OK, um, Kay, and if you don't mind, can you also put the, the link to our uh, website? Not a thank problem. You. So much. You're awesome. Thank you. Um, and once again, uh, real quick, if you could just take a few minutes and see if you can get this on your phone. And once again, it's easy to complete uh, <laughs> survey on our event today. And I, I thank you all so much for participating in the event today. Um, and I look so forward to working with every single one of you. And of course, our, our fabulous uh, uh, 
subject matter experts again for this 2022-2023 uh, uh, DLL year. Um, and I'm just going to um, share just a couple more things, uh, you know, to stay, stay, visit scaleit.org, where you can get to our website as well through the Scaleit main page, right? And the, the technology, uh, the digital equity, um, uh, digital uh, equity and inclusion um, tab uh, there as well. And that takes us to our website. And, and of course, stay in touch with us with all our social media. Um, you know, and I, I, I thank you all very much again. And uh, I'm going to go back to this uh, QR code, uh, make sure that I get the maximum amount of you uh, responding now. And then hopefully uh, later, um, you'll complete this as I sent out the certificate and uh, a link to the, the survey, um, the survey and the, um, the whole presentation, in case you didn't get it here. All right, and then just to leave you with my my favorite my favorite uh, slide that I use quite a bit. Um, this um, is um, sort of my mantra. <laughs> so um, hopefully it it uh, creates some excitement. Are you still here, Michael? I don't see you. Do we lose Michael? Looks like it. Maybe we're all supposed to leave. Yeah, I think I think it's over. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, Michael, <laughs> Michael must have lost his connection. Goodbye. Oh, I know. I was like, oh, it's like, all of a sudden, like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I think he had 